I have to hit start in two different places. Mm -hmm. Okay, and while we let people cycle in for a moment, I will just get us started with a couple of logistics. So hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, for one, I think one of the first times that introduction actually applies to the people <laughs> presenting today, because we have Patrick uh, where it's morning, Michael where it's evening, and us where it's afternoon. So um, welcome to the, uh, third week of the fall 2021 iteration of the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. This week, we hear from Dr. Patrick Green and Dr. Michael Kant. We'll hear from Patrick first. And before I introduce him, just a couple of announcements. If you're participating via Zoom, you'll see a Q&A tab on the top or bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you might have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. Um, at the end of each of the talks, we'll go through those questions, starting with those that have the most upvotes. So put your questions there. And then second, as always, we're gonna be posting recordings of these talks to YouTube shortly after they conclude for your viewing and reviewing pleasure. Uh, so I will now introduce our first speaker today. It's with a great deal of personal pleasure that I'll start by introducing Patrick Green. Patrick is a California native, went to undergrad at UCLA before coming east for his PhD, where he which he completed with uh, Sheila Paddock at Duke University studying animal contests and biomechanics in mantis shrimp. During that time, he also worked closely with Steve Nowicki studying color perception in zebra finches and continued at Duke as a postdoc with Steve before receiving a prestigious Human Frontier Science Program postdoctoral fellowship to work with Michael Kant at the University of Exeter, studying conflict between groups of uh, banded mongoose. And that's a fellowship that he's now finishing uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, back on the West Coast. Um, I've had the privilege of being a friend and occasional collaborator with Patrick for seven years now. And for me, he's been a, a personal example, uh, both in his scientific rigor and the very high personal standards to which he holds himself. Like he's, if you don't know Patrick, he's one of the very kindest people you'll meet inside or outside of academia. Uh, he embodies the character traits that make up John Wooden's pyramid of success. Uh, so I am glad. Uh, Patrick could join us today and tell us about his work, and I will turn things over to him now. Well, thanks a lot, Matthew. Um, let me share my screen here before we get too far. Can you all see that? All right, great. Thanks a lot for that very kind introduction. Um, yeah, and thanks all for uh, for being here and watching this talk. Um, I was I remember being in my first lockdown summer for the first iteration of these uh, seminars, and they've been just like a great resource and so really well done uh, to Matthew and Liz for all that organization. Um, yeah, as Matthew said, I'm a Human Frontier Science Program long-term fellow currently at UC Santa Barbara, but the work I'll be telling you about today, I conducted mostly at Duke University and the University of Exeter in Cornwall. So uh, I like to study animal contests and the reason that I do is that these contests are just a really important aspect of life history for many animals. Uh, these contests dictate access to essential resources. So uh, in these examples, these damselflies, these anoles, and these anemones are all competing over access to territory. Uh, whereas these red deer here in the top right, these are males that are competing over access to groups of females. And in this case, the, uh, the male that loses this contest might not get a chance uh, to mate for the entire year. Now, because these contests are so important to animal life history, um, there's been a great deal of both theoretical and empirical research on, on animal contests, really centered around the question of how animals gather information and use that information to resolve these contests safely. Now, these contests are thought to come with, with a lot of potentially high costs, whether that's the energy cost of, of just physically competing, or maybe even the risk of injury or even death. Um, and so, yeah, because of that, there's been this great deal of research into this, this information gathering process. Animals are thought to gather information about their own fighting ability, that of their opponent, and even something about the value of the contested resource and use that to resolve the conflict while minimizing uh, these costs as much as possible. So what I'll do in this, this quick talk is give you a very brief introduction to kind of how we think about this using examples from my PhD work. And then I'll go into my more recent research uh, that will scale this idea up to how uh, animals in social living groups might do this same process. 
So in my PhD, I studied these animals called mantis shrimp, and I showed that they use a ritualized striking behavior called Telson sparring as a means of assessing ability, in this case, which is body mass. So to do this, I paired mantis shrimp in individual one-on-one -on -one contests, and I found that the best predictor of contest success is body mass. So heavier shrimp are beating lighter shrimp. During these contests, mantis shrimp use a ritualized striking behavior, which we call Telson sparring. So in this image on the left, you can see there's a mantis shrimp coming out of a burrow in a rock. Uh, I pointed out its eyes and its dorsal side is facing out of the screen toward you. It's swinging its left appendage through the water and hitting the mantis shrimp on the right. Now that shrimp on the right has its tail or what we call its telson coiled up in front of its body like a shield. And it's receiving the strike on that shield. What it's gonna do next is it's gonna unfurl its body and then deliver a strike to the mantis shrimp on the left. And that shrimp on the left will have also coiled its telson. So they go back and forth in this way, exchanging strikes. So these strikes occur in most contests and almost all of those strikes land on that protective or coiled uh, tailplate. Furthermore, if we look at the progression of behaviors that competitors follow in their contests, these match uh, the uh, predictions of a theoretical model that suggests these animals are assessing relative ability, which again here is body mass. So hopefully this very quick introduction gives you an idea of when we're thinking about dyadic or one-on-one -on -one contests, we're focusing on how these animals are assessing ability. Uh, and another term for ability in this literature is resource holding potential or RHP. So again, in, in this very uh, kind of simple toy example, we might have two animals that are competing. One is much smaller than the other. That smaller competitor might assess that it's at an RHP disadvantage and decide to leave the fight. Okay, so now I'd like us to, to scale this up to a different level, right? So what if each competitor here is a member of a larger social group? What is the RHP or the fighting ability of a group in these intergroup contests? Well, it could happen at the group level or it could be something about individual level properties. At the group level, we can think that the number of members in the group might really determine who wins or who loses, or maybe groups that are on average bigger. Um, but it could be something about individuals. Let's say that having simply the largest individual in the total fight is really what you need to, to win this contest. And not only do we get to think about things at these different levels in these intergroup contests, but these are, are uh, really widespread taxonomically. These things occur in taxa as diverse as ants and chimpanzees. So there's a lot of cool stuff to sink our teeth into in these intergroup contests. So I've been studying uh, intergroup contests in banded mongooses, as Matthew said. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into the system here. I'll let Michael uh, do more of that introduction in his talk, but I will give you some quick background into their contests. So these contests are frequent and also dangerous. Groups get into about an average of one contest per month, sometimes up to one per week. And both adults and pups can die as a result of these contests. I'll try to show you a quick video here of what these look like. So there's one group at the bottom of the video and then one group kind of towards the middle top. Right now, they're both organized in what we call battle lines, so these bunched up kind of formations. And hopefully you can see that these groups are lunging toward each other and coming back in unison. These contests can then break into one-on-one -on -one fights between individuals with lots of wrestling and biting. And here, that bottom group is now doing this really intense scent marking behavior. So though we see that the entire group does participate in these contests, there is differential investment here. Males are more aggressive and also more likely to die as compared to females. And subordinate males, so those who uh, did not mate guard a female in the most recent mating attempt, are really the most aggressive overall. Because this is a long-term uh, study population, we have a ton of data. Uh, we know a lot about the membership of each group, uh, the age of those members and their dominance. And for many individuals, we have really good uh, resolution weight data around the time of a contest. And I'm gonna come back to that weight data in just a bit. I would like to thank the uh, research field team. These are a group of five Ugandan researchers. They're in the field every day doing all the data collection and really without their efforts, none of this stuff would be possible. So with that background, we can set up some hypotheses for what RHP is in this system. That is what variables predict which group wins or loses the contest. We can think about it first at the level of all adults, right? Meaning that uh, the contribution of all adults is really necessary uh, to win a contest. But because we know that males are really the ones that are participating more, maybe it's traits of just the males that we should be paying attention to. And finally, it could be something just about those subordinate males because those are the ones that are most aggressive. 
And then within each of these groups, we can think about first properties at the group level, let's say the number of adults or the number of males or subordinate males, maybe the average weight of those members or their average age. We can also think about this at the level of the individual, right? Maybe having a single really heavy male or a really old subordinate male is what you need to win this contest. So to parse apart which of these properties at which level really uh, predicts contest success, we took an information theoretic approach. So we built 12 candidate models with different relevant combinations of these predictors. For example, we might predict that a focal group is gonna win a contest by having more males than the rival group, by um, having males that are on average older, and by having a, a really heavy male that's heavier than the male in the rival group. So we built 12 models like this, and then we took measures of model fit to our data, and then also the estimate values for the predictors in those models. And we combined that information to figure out which of these predictors is most relevant to predicting contest success. So I'll show you a bunch of box plots here. Um, some of these predictors are gonna be on the y-axis, and then our, our measure of the importance of those predictors is on the X, and that's called model averaged coefficient. That's just the estimate value for the predictors in the model scaled by uh, the fit of the models in which those predictors occur. And you're gonna see box plots here. And the reason you'll see that is because as I mentioned earlier, we're missing weight data for some individuals in the population. And so what we did is we filled in some of those missing values using information from other members of the group. And we repeated this process 10,000 times in a semi-random, a manner in order to get distributions uh, of those values for those predictors. And I'm happy to talk about this later on if you'd like. So here what we see from this approach is that the number of males that a group has and the age of the oldest male in the group are really the best metrics for RHP in this system. Not only do they have the highest coefficients, but these two variables occurred in four of the five best fit models. So what is it about these properties that really matters to contest success? For number of males, we think that it's related simply to male participation in the first case. So males are the ones that are really investing most in these contests. So really their participation should be most important to determining who wins and loses. Males are also larger and heavier than females. And again, these contests are really physical. So that advantage might be important. On the maximum male age side, we think it's related to experience. So here I'm showing you a plot of the age of males in our population on the x-axis and the number of contests in which they uh, participated on the Y, you can see that as males get older, they get more and more contest experience. I will say that there is a limit to this uh, advantage of having an oldest male. Once a male gets to be about 11 years old, it actually becomes a hindrance to its group success as compared to a help. So, but for now, I just wanna bring this back to our initial question of how are animals assessing to resolve their conflicts? In the very quick example of mantis shrimp, I showed that they're using ritualized striking behaviors as a means of gathering information on body mass, and that helps them resolve their conflicts safely. In the banded mongoose case, we're simply at the RHP stage right now, but we're seeing that this is a mix of group and individual level properties. And to figure out how they're actually assessing this information, how they're gathering that information, uh, we're hopefully gonna use some, some more uh, database approaches and maybe even some experimental approaches. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and to these people and organizations for funding and feedback, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Really interesting. I, I have a question to start us out, which is, uh, it's more about the like moment to moment behavior of these interactions. And so like in the video you showed, you see, you, know, you see this coordinated moving forward and backwards. And I'm curious whether you, how that coordination works. If you think it's just like, um, like flocking birds, right? And it's just a very simple heuristic based on physical proximity of, you know, related parts, or if there's something more complicated and, and coordinated. That's a really good question. I actually don't really know. Um, I could think that that proximity really plays a big role. Um, I think one of the interesting ways that, that you could think about this is really starting to figure out what happens when those contests break up, right? Because at the very battle line stage, they're really kind of, you could essentially imagine being a mongoose and you could feel your group mates right next to you. And there's some aspect of when these contests break out into these one-on-one -on -one fights, then somehow you have to come back and find your other group members. And that might be where this role of scent marking becomes really important because you mm -hmm. see these members all jumbled up on each other doing some really intense scent marking behavior. Um, so there could be some aspects there of, of, you know, 
chemical sensation in some way or some memory of your, your group mates as compared to out group members. But yeah, that's a great question. It's interesting also to think about like how the group decides to flee, right? And yeah. and, and if it's one-on-one -on -one losses that then lead individuals to flee. And, well, that's, uh, yeah, that's the exact kind of question that we think about in the dyadic contest world is when do you make the decision to give up? And that's something that we really haven't thought too much about in the intergroup contest world. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think given the time, we should actually hold things there. Um, one other thing though, well, now that I'm, I'm just thinking it's so interesting, is like in human um, battles, for example, the vast majority of injury and casualties occur on the retreat, right? And so uh, I don't really know what the point of bringing that up is, but it, it's interesting to think about how uh, potentially the decision to retreat is really important, both in terms of yeah. you know resource access, but also maybe injury risk. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Anyways, thanks, Patrick. Really interesting yeah. talk. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Michael Kant, Professor of Evolutionary Biology in the Center for Ecology and Conservation at the University of Exeter. Michael is the director of the Banded Mongoose Research Project in Uganda, a long-term longitudinal study of banded mongoose that Patrick introduced us to and, and we'll hear more about. He established the project in 1995 along with Tim Kluttenbrock, and since that time, the system has been wonderfully productive. And one of the things that makes banded mongoose different from nearly all of the other mammal systems that we've heard about in this series, which one of the reasons I was really glad to have this set of talks, is that they're cooperative breeders. And uh, Michael's research has then ha has made major contributions to our understanding of the evolution of cooperation and, and conflict. Um, there's a paper that came out of Michael's lab earlier this year in Nature Communications titled, A Veil of Ignorance Can Promote Fairness in a Mammal Society. And I won't spoil it, uh, just in case he's gonna talk about it today, I'm not sure, but I'd encourage everyone to read it because it, it makes really beautiful connections across biology and moral philosophy. And as a devout Rawlsian and occasional uh, moral philosopher, I really enjoyed reading it. And I think it's the kind of uh, interdisciplinary connections that I'd love to see more of. So I'm excited to welcome Mike today and I'll turn things over to him now. Thank you, Matthew, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, I'm also really happy to be following Patrick because Patrick's been in my group for the last two years and has just been a wonderful person to work with. And he's a he's sorely missed from our group, but he kept all our spirits up during lockdown. So I want to say thanks for, the, for that, Patrick. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna start by talking about adaptation actually. Um, I like to put this slide up to remind us that as biologists we're fortunate in lots of ways but in a couple of ways in particular. First because the things that we study are so aesthetically and functionally incredible as this slide conveys I think. Um, and secondly because we've got this single overarching theory which helps us to make sense of all of this amazing variation in pattern and colour and form and behaviour which is of course Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is also remarkable because it's so simple. If you've just got these three conditions, if individuals differ, um, if some of those variants are more successful at reproducing themselves, and if those differences are heritable, and if you kind of turn the handle on this process, then this is the process that can explain the evolution of adaptations, which you could define as the appearance of good design. And it's still the only theory that we have to explain the evolution of adaptation. I could put up any number of pictures of adaptations. I think I just like looking at pictures of anglerfish for some reason, um, with adaptations to catch their prey in these kind of incredibly difficult conditions in the deep sea. We've got adaptations among prey to incredible examples of mimicry, um, and also incredible examples of advertisement to deter predation. Within species, we also have lots of adaptations associated with conflict, such as large weapons uh, or increased uh, body size, such as in, in these male elephant seals. And I think these adaptations for conflict kind of fit with the historical perception of natural selection in, in these nakedly competitive terms, such as being described as the, the struggle for life, survival of the fittest, or um, Tennyson's co-opted phrase, nature read in tooth and claw. But of course, if you look around, you see things like this. You see animals grooming each other or, or helping each other. 
um, forming alliances, uh, forming teams to cooperate over uh, finding prey, such as these, as in these lions. And the organisms that I study, you see kind of dramatic examples of cooperation um, in cooperative breeders, which are species which um, help to rear offspring that are not their own, such as these meerkats that, that everyone will be familiar with. Um, but the same kind of system occurs in many other types of animal society, including these um, wasps, which I've worked on. And this kind of, uh, these, these examples of cooperation reach their zenith, I think, in the eusocial insects where um, you get the evolution of complete specialization in helping roles and the evolution of uh, sterile workers that spend their entire lives um, assisting others to reproduce. And of course, this was a puzzle for Darwin because he couldn't see how his theory, which after all was based on the idea that natural selection will favor variants that are best at reproducing themselves, he couldn't see easily why, how that could favor the evolution of uh, organisms that never reproduced. Um, although he did make some really good suggestions, um, but it took another hundred years before we got a kind of co coherent theory of how this could evolve through the work of Bill Hamilton and George Price and others. Um, in particular, Hamilton, I think, who made contributions to the development of inclusive fitness theory and multi-level, the first sort of major application of multi-level selection theory, and also reciprocity and other aspects linked to um, the evolution of cooperation. And this, these models and uh, theories of how cooperation, how cooperation can evolve in the face of self-interest in the 80s and 90s started to crystallize into um, one of the really cool big ideas in evolutionary biology, which is the major um, transitions theory of biological complexity. It's the idea that um, complex life has evolved via, via a series of these cooperative transitions where um, selfish, self-replicating units have got together into teams and started to reproduce for the good of the group rather than themselves. Um, and I think this, this has its genesis in this amazing book by Leo Buss and also this um, seminal book by Maynard Smith and Zathmari. <clears throat> and this is a, a, a kind of cartoon of what's proposed to occur during these transitions. So here's your selfish units at the top. They, through the evolution of cooperation, are proposed to form simple cooperative groups. And then those groups, via processes of conflict suppression and a division of labor, form new units, which start to reproduce as a collective and exhibit adaptations at the level of the co collective. Oops. Hang on, sorry. So, so uh, these new units can form the basis of uh, the next transition. And in this process, one of, one of the things I want to kind of uh, talk about a little bit is that uh, another transition that occurs in the way that we need to think about fitness from uh, fitness in terms of um, the success of individual units of producing more units early on in this process to fitness in terms of the success of collectives at producing daughter collectives at the end of this process. So here's sort of three, I've picked out three of these major transitions. Um, so the origin of life is proposed to have involved a, a transition of this sort where self-replicating molecules got together into uh, teams and formed lipid bilayers and the first proto cells uh, and simple cells. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple of billion years later, we get the, the start of this transition from complex unicellular life to uh, multicellular organisms. And in the last 50 to 100 million years, we start to have the emergence of one of the more recent major transitions where individual multi multicellular organisms have got together into cooperative societies of the kind that I'm going to focus on here. Often in discussions of major transitions, humans are then kind of considered as later uh, examples of this major transition where primate societies through the evolution of language have formed human societies. And then over the last 200,000 years, there's been this um, huge increase in the scale at which cooperation um, occurs, the scale of societies uh, where cooperation um, occurs. 
So in these transitions, these are the kind of key features that I want to focus on. And this provides, I suppose, the kind of a deeper backdrop to the work on animal societies that, um, that I've been interested in, in for the last uh, 20 years or so. First of all, within group conflict is suppressed. There's a shift from fitness in terms of type one, this re replication of individuals to fitness, type two fitness, the replication of groups. And conflict is shifted from within group conflict to conflict between groups. There's the suppression of within group conflict and the exacerbation, I guess, of uh, conflict between groups. And I'm going to focus on each of these aspects and make reference to these um, using the case study of this banded mongoose population that we've been studying in Uganda. So that was my background. I'm going to move on to this kind of case study, and then I'm going to um, finish with a little discursive um, discussion about group adaptation. So that's the, our study site. It's this amazing peninsula, Maya, Maya Peninsula in Western Uganda, which uh, is on the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda. It's a peninsula that sticks out into Lake Edward, and it's jam-packed with banded mongooses. So here you can see um, territories of our um, study population. Uh, at any one time, there's uh, about 150 to 200 adults in 10 groups. And um, as Patrick mentioned, this was started in 1995 for my PhD. Um, and this is Francis Mwangusha here, who was my first field assistant for my PhD and is still is now the field manager of the project. And we've been working together continuously for, for 26 years. Um, and as Patrick says, this field, type, field team in Uganda is just an amazing, um, an amazing uh, team and a, a huge reason for the success of the project. This, from these kind of humble beginnings, it's grown into quite a performance involving lots of collaborators in different teams um, ar around uh, Europe and in Uganda. And I'd just like to use this slide to kind of acknowledge the fact that there's uh, a huge number of people have contributed over the years um, and contributed to some of the results that I'll be describing. So this is banded mongooses in the morning. They get up at a reasonable hour, about seven o'clock in the morning, and then they go off on a foraging trip, digging up millipedes and beetles and things like that. Uh, and then it gets kind of too hot for them. So they all retire under a bush or something and they lie around for a few hours doing not very much. Um, and then they have another foraging trip to find their way back to a den where they'll spend the night. These are the observation conditions. We can walk around and uh, the, many of the groups are habituated to our presence so we can get some really detailed um, data on behavior and life history. With the population's trapped and marked and we visit them daily. They kind of weigh themselves, uh, which is handy. And we have now, thanks to the work of uh, led by Hazel Nichols in Swansea, we have a nine generation deep genetic pedigree. Um, so we know in great detail the genetic history of each uh, individual in the population. There's also a very large life history database, which um, is managed by Faye Thompson. Um, and uh, we have like a, a huge amount of information on everything that's happened to each individual from birth to death. And in the last five years or so, we've started to um, take advantage of some of the huge opportunities that are represented by these advances in tracking technology. So we've just um, got a grant to use drones, uh, which in uh, combination with um, AI algorithms developed by Dan Franks in York, we are able to follow, to individually recognize mongooses and follow them through this heterogeneous habitat, even as they move um, in and out of bushes, which is um, something that's extremely exciting. And, I, and I'll, I'll come to um, examples of where I think this could be, uh, this could open a new window into uh, understanding how the system works. Okay, so I want to just very quickly outline three major features of this population um, and link that to these uh, ideas of major transitions and what adaptation means uh, in a system like this. First of all, their reproduction, they're very unusual in terms of their reproduction. Multiple females in each group breed together. There's almost no reproductive suppression of females. And what's more, we found out very early on that they synchronize birth, usually in most breeding temps, to exactly the same evening and probably the same morning. 
So that up to 12 females can give birth synchronously on the same day in this way. So you go there one day and there's like seven or eight females waddling around heavily pregnant. And then you go the next morning and the females don't come out of the den, the males come out. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning, the females will all come out together and they'll be slim. And you can see that they've all given birth um, synchronously. That litter, which is sometimes 30 pups and more, because there's so many females contributing to it, is kept underground for about a month of life. Um, and then once they emerge from the uh, den around about a month old, they form, there's, there's another unusual aspect of this system, which is they form these one-to-one -one, um, kind of carer pup relationships, which we call the escort system, where the same adult will consistently look after the same pup in this kind of exclusive relationship. And we know that these escorts are no more closely related to the pups in their care than are a, a randomly selected individual. So there's no preferential caring of offspring according to relatedness. And we've shown, I think, pretty convincingly now um, through a variety of experiments and tests that there's what we describe as a veil of ignorance over parentage in this communal litter. So that none of the mothers, none of the fathers or any of the other group members know which pup is the offspring of which female. And um, as Matthew uh, mentioned, we, this year we published a kind of final confirmation of this really in this paper where we wanted to try and um, explore the consequences of this veil of ignorance by disturbing the level of inequality in the system and then seeing how the animals responded to that. So what we did was we did an experiment where we tried to amplify inequality in the group and we fed, we did that by feeding pregnant females, half the pregnant females in each group in the latter half of pregnancy, we'd give them a boiled egg every day or half a boiled egg, um, leaving the other half of, of pregnant females as matched controls. And then we observed that who cared for which offspring. The result of this experiment was that the fed females produced larger offspring. But the really kind of surprising thing um, was that, uh, and, and I have to say that I expected this to lead to a kind of silver spoon effect where larger offspring would then get more preferential access to escorting and those initial inequalities would be amplified by the system of of cooperative care. And of course, banded mongooses are wonderful at doing everything wrong, uh, but much, in a much more interesting way, what they did was those fed females elevated their level of help, but they directed that help towards the smaller control offspring, not their own young. So here we have um, the level of this, this discrimination towards smaller control offspring showed by these fed females, whereas the unfed females helped at a lower rate and didn't discriminate between uh, pups on the basis of their size. And the consequence of this was that this remedial helping by fed females evened out, leveled out the inequalities among the offspring, which is um, something that we predict, if we could predict once we, once we thought through the consequences of there being a veil of ignorance cast over the parentage in the system. This is what theoretically we can understand that females could gain from doing when in good condition to minimize the risk that the small offspring of their own young. Um, so yeah, do, do have a look at that paper if that's um, what, what interests you. I found that really kind of an enjoyable study to, to be part of. Okay, the second uh, aspect of the system that I want to talk about is their, uh, the way that they disperse. And in particular, the idea that um, dis the dispersal system in this system can be understood as reproduction at the level of the collective. So what happens is there's not the, almost no one leaves their group voluntarily. The group, groups grow, 85% of males and females are born and die in their natal group. But when groups get bigger and bigger in size, suddenly overnight, you, again, you go there one day, everything's fine. You go there the next day, all hell's broken loose and eight or 10 or 12 females usually have been marked out for eviction. And they're repeatedly attacked, usually mostly by other females, older females, and driven, violently driven out of the group. And those groups then go off and disperse and those females will meet a cohort of other males and then they'll form a group and start a new group in the study population. 
when Faye Thompson, who was my PhD student, started a PhD, I asked her to go and sort of try and uh, try and try and understand what the sort of history of this kind of group level reproduction was in our population. And she came up with this amazing work of art, which um, I do think should be uh, hanging on my wall. But it, it shows that nearly most of the groups in our population have come from this group in the top left hand corner, 1B here, which is a group that lives in a sort of five star hotel grounds with like manicured lawns and they get sort of bits of sort of steak thrown at them by, by tourists and so on. So it's obviously a, a hugely rich territory. And as a consequence, they've been responsible for populating most of our study population through this group level reproduction. Faye also showed that during these violent evictions, it's closer relatives that are targeted for um, eviction, which is another puzzling and very interesting um, feature of the system. And the third thing I want to talk about is warfare or intergroup conflict, because as Patrick says, there are very frequent and very violent intergroup encounters. Um, I'll, I'll show you, it, it, it's again, it's uh, easiest to just show the video. Patrick's already shown the, the first video I was gonna show, but what I'll do is I'll just want you to focus in on one little detail, which is, uh, I always have fun watching this. So in the first sort of five seconds of the video in the sort of, in the left hand, in the, the, the group that's nearest the camera, towards the left, you'll see there's a little, a smallish individual, probably a sort of sub-adult, that just pings out of the front line and is like jumps out and goes to the back and then kind of comes around and sort of pretends to, <laughs> pretends to be sort of involved in the, in the fight after that. Um, so he's, he's going to ping out of about here. You might be able to see it, even though it's a bit jittery, I, I guess, over Zoom. Okay. And then he comes back around and he's kind of he's, he comes back around and he's kind of more towards the back, but he's obviously being pushed towards the front and probably facing this grisly, horrible looking old male that uh, Patrick has uh, hypothesized about and thought there's no way I'm staying at the front of this fight and jump to the back. So there's all these interesting collective action problems which are bound up in um, something that when you see something like that. I just want to show here that this is this is what this is why they get why they're so violent why they're so dangerous these fights it's what happens is that those battle lines break eventually they kind of they charge each other and they break up and if you find yourself on the wrong side surrounded by the enemy then you get surrounded by like 10 other mongooses and they try to rip you to pieces so this is what's kind of happening here i can say that this animal was actually rescued by its own group it didn't suffer any really serious injury but it'll give you the kind of feel for how violent these can be. Right at the end, right at the end there, there's two running back onto their own side that bump face first into each other as they were running back. To, um, it's endless fun, you know, watching these videos. <laughs> okay, so what drives intergroup conflict? Well, we know that groups fight when resources are scarce. We think because they have to forage in wider, in a larger area um, in order to get their sort of daily food intake. And this means that they start bumping into each other more. We know that from Faye's work that they fight more when females are fertile, in when they're in estrus, and also when the group is older and when there's a high risk of inbreeding, because, because of this fact that uh, hardly anyone ever leads, leaves the group, um, groups, as they get older from the time that they're founded, they, when they're founded, the males and females are not related to each other at all. But because hardly anyone ever leaves, in the number of years, as the group gets older and older, relatedness starts to build up between the males and females. So the females have very limited options if they're seeking outbred matings. So what they do is they go in search of matings from the members of other groups outside their, um, outside their own territory. I've got another video, the last one, which is showing this happening. So over here, there's a, you'll see a female that's crossed over from this group to here, and then she's going to come back out. And you'll see, if you, if you kind of look carefully, you'll see her mating 
and her other group is going to come back and try and rescue her. I suppose rescue is the wrong, <laughs> the wrong word to use. Um, okay, so what we know is that in these battles, we know that there's male and females uh, have very different costs and benefits. Males are the ones that pay the costs in these fights. So this is the death rate in terms of intergroup mortality percent per year um, in males and females. And it shows that it's, it's males are the ones that are getting injured. Um, females are almost never killed or injured um, in, in these fights. Anecdotally, the field teams say that sometimes a male will be kind of fighting away and he'll come face to face with a female and just be kind of like, get out of the way, you know, just let me out the other males. So they, they, they do seem to kind of reserve their aggression for other males. But it's females that gain the benefit. So these graphs show the uh, lifetime number of extra group offspring produced by males and females in the top right hand panel as a function of the number of intergroup interactions that they have in their lifetime. Uh, so females gain these extra group offspring, the more of these intergroup interactions they are involved in. Um, and in terms of lifetime reproductive success, their lifetime reproductive success increases much more steeply than does male reproductive success or as they are, have more of these intergroup interactions. So females gain the benefits and males pay the costs. And together with Rufus Johnston, we um, developed a kind of, uh, well, Rufus adapted the hawk dove model um, to a group setting to explore the uh, consequences of a system where leaders can initiate conflicts but not pay the full share of the costs, where the costs are actually paid by followers rather than leaders. Um, and this resonates with our kind of uh, understanding of human conflict, where often it's generals who send their troops into battle from the safety of uh, their position, their privileged position. And sure enough, this model predicts that when you get this decoupling of initiators or leaders from the costs that they're inciting, then the outcome is extremely severe damaging levels of intergroup violence. And that's certainly the case in banded mongooses. So, um, these are the only other species that we could find comparable data on the rate of intergroup mortality uh, per year. And on average, banded mongooses have higher, a higher death rate from war than do chimps. Uh, and it's comparable, and certainly more than meerkats, um, showing that it's not just a mongoose thing. There's something about this system which is associated with very severe violence. And it's about comparable to reported levels or estimated levels of uh, death in war in um, hunter-gatherers and subsistence farming societies. Okay, so <clears throat> that's kind of all the data I, I, I want to present. And I just want to kind of pose this question really, which is something that we, we've been thinking about um, quite and scratching our head about quite a lot because, you know, where, where are banded mongooses in this transition? How are we to understand the system in terms of this transition between um, between simple cooperative groups and new evolutionary individuals. Well, it's certainly the case that there's still a lot of within group conflict. There's still um, severe infanticide. If those females don't give birth on the same day, if they get it wrong, then there's a bloodbath and off offspring are killed. It seems to be the threat of infanticide that drives and keeps uh, uh, enforces this extreme birth synchrony. There's also aggression uh, between males and females during mating and also between um, uh, uh, evidence of that there's aggression over food items, large food items and things like that. But there are also several features of, of this system which you can plausibly understand as adaptations at the level of the collective, such as the birth synchrony has benefits to the group in terms of um, uh, in, ensuring that a, a large number of offspring are recruited into the group, um, which is really, really important for competition with other groups. 
Um, there's a very strongly male bias sex ratio among adults. It's about 1.6 males per female for reasons that we still don't really understand. Um, but those males are warriors and groups without a very large male uh, fighting force do very poorly in intergroup competition. And usually they're at risk of having all of their pups killed by neighboring groups. Um, they reproduce at the level of the individual, of course they do, but they do also reproduce at the level of the collective. We've got measures of both of these types of fitness in this system. And finally, they have this extreme levels of intergroup conflict, which more and more seem to be kind of fundamental to explaining many of the strange and unusual features of this system. So I think the next step for us is to try and think of ways that we might try and understand this a bit more quantitatively. Um, and one of the ideas that we're exploring at the moment is to try and see what, what is the relationship between this fitness type two and fitness type one in this society. Because um, there's uh, one idea in Samir Okasha's Levels of Selection book um, where Samir proposes that um, during this pro process of major, a major transition, there's a decoupling of these two types of fitness. So that early on in a major transition, type two fitness is just defined as the average of part, the particle fitness of type one fitness. Um, and at the end of, uh, uh, somewhere in the middle of this process, um, Samir proposes that there should be a kind of a, pro a proportional relationship between these two, two things so that there should be some kind of positive relationship between fitness two and fitness one. But by the end of the process, these two fitnesses have become decoupled. Um, Richard Michaud has also proposed something similar. You can understand that bit at the end if you think about, you know, like a, a whale reproducing, you know, you count the number of daughter or offspring whales that the number produced is decoupled from the number of replications of the cells that make up the whale. Um, so that's that decoupling is the hallmark of a completed major transition. Um, so I'm kind of interested in the link between these two types of fitness and also gathering other data from other systems where people might have access to this kind of uh, these two measures. And if you do, I'd be really, really interested to hear from you. So please just drop me a line. Maybe, maybe we can kind of think, think of uh, some path forward. Okay, um, I'm just going to uh, close with uh, just like a five, five, 10 minute discussion of this topic of group adaptation um, and also this idea of group agency, which is interesting to think about, I think. Um, so here we, we had our sort of theory of natural selection leading to adaptations. But of course, this process is agnostic um, with respect to the level at which adaptations can occur. I mean, entities can differ. It, it, it would be the broader interpretation of this process. Um, and this question of whether groups can actually uh, exhibit adaptations um, is a, a, has a long and vexed history, I think. There, the, the, and, uh, there's a kind of disconnect, I think, between the, the way that um, empirical biologists tend to view this question and theoreticians tend to view it. So I think the most empirical biologists would accept that there are clear examples of some group adaptations in animal societies, like the, the, the waggle dance of the honeybee or the intricate process by which honeybees um, debate and choose nesting sites as seen in the work of, um, demonstrated in the work of Tom Seeley. Um, but what about these kind of behaviors that we're observing? Can we think of these as group adaptations or, or should we, is that a kind of heresy to propose that? Well, group adaptation from a the theoretical point of view has been explored by a, um, as part of this kind of uh, formal Darwinism project, um, which was led by um, Alan Graff and, and, and built on by other theoreticians um, such as Andy Gardner, where the idea is to try and find some kind of mathematical uh, justification or formalism to uh, justify this idea, um, the, the verbal idea in Darwin's theory that the process of natural selection should lead to adaptation or the, or the appearance of good design. So what Alan has been working on for over a decade now is to try and find mathematical links which will justify, um, which, which will make clear what properties entities need to have in order for them to function as fitness maximizing agents. And as part of this work, um, Alan and Andy um, 
examined the case of group adaptation. When can groups be fitness maximizing agents? And uh, together with work by um, Samir uh, Okasha and Patanota, two key uh, features tend to emerge from this theoretical work. The group adaptation, the idea that groups can function as, um, uh, as, as fitness maximizing agents requires either that they're clonal or that they're zero um, variance within groups in terms of fitness. There's, there's complete leveling of fitness within groups. And I think a kind of graphical version of that argument was put, is, is uh, put forward in this paper by Stu West et al. Um, in, in PNES, which where they, they've designed this schematic with microbes in mind. So the idea is that if you, um, as you, as you reduce within group conflict, and the main driver of that in, that they're thinking about is in terms of relatedness increasing in a group, then you kind of increase the level of opt the optimum level of cooperation. And you only approach the group optimum in terms of cooperation when you've completely eliminated within group conflict, when, when relatedness is one or when within group conflict is zero. So it's right in this top left-hand corner. That's where you can get um, the conditions satisfied for groups to function as fitness maximizing agents. I think that one of the problems with this um, it's, it's a very high bar to set for group adaptation because neither the social insect colonies such as honeybees nor even biological individuals such as ourselves satisfy either of these criteria. Um, so there is this interesting disconnect between the requirements of the theory and what we kind of see in this sort of slightly more messy world of real organisms. So I think I prefer to try and think about this question of like group adaptation on a, in a more continuous basis basis. Um, and I like this scheme proposed by Ellen Clark, uh, where um, she identifies these two mechanisms that can contribute to a, the level of individuality of any biological entity. You, you need kind of policing mechanisms, mechanisms that kind of suppress conflict within groups. They inhibit within group selection. And you also need um, demarcation mechanisms, which can increase the strength of between group competition. And Ellen suggests that, you know, there's been a lot of attention focused on policing mechanisms and not so much on demarcation mechanisms. Um, but I kind of like this scheme because you can kind of map onto these two mechanisms, the, the sort of features that we see in, in the mongooses, such as this veil of ignorance, which is kind of meiosis-like in drawing this kind of um, increasing uncertainty about the payoffs involved in, in conflict. Um, policing mechanisms such as coercion and punishment and so on. Um, and demarcation mechanisms, particularly barriers to group entry and warfare and stereotyping of the opposition, I think these are all ripe for further exploration as interesting aspects of social evolution in animal societies. And the other, the other key feature, I think, if you focus on those mechanisms, is that, uh, and, and why our animal societies, the kind of furry animals that we're, <laughs> we're looking at might not be served by this uh, microbe-like perspective is because we, and these animals are dynamic. They, they, they act together in cohesive units when they need to, in the face of battle, for example. But when, they're, when the opponent's gone, they go back to just wandering around in a much less cohesive fashion. They show elements of group adaptation when they need to, and they show ele elements of group agency when they need to um, in a flexible way. And the, the way they get there is through behavioral mechanisms of policing and demarcation and negotiation. Um, and I've got my last two slides. Um, I'm just, I, I'm a huge fan of Samira Kasha, but I, I was st struck by this quote in his book about group agency, um, because I think group agency is a topic of much, it's worth uh, thinking about further in terms of whether, and it's a very interesting, a philosophical area to get into, but also in terms of agency in an evolutionary sense. He argues or suggests that a committee whose members disagree may be able to speak with a common voice if a suitable compromise is found, but a biological group riven by internal conflicts cannot negotiate its way to a solution. So for human social groups, greater disagreement is compatible with group agency than in the evolutionary case. 
And I think that this is a very useful quote because it focuses attention on negotiation. And as many of you will know, if you follow animals like mongooses or other um, vertebrate groups, every day is full of negotiation. Every minute of the day is a negotiation about where to go and what to do. And they do negotiate their ways to a solution faced by these problems. So these animal societies manage to achieve this unity with diversity. And I think that this, by studying them, uh, particularly the way that they achieve this unity with diversity, it means that work, this work of this type can still contribute a lot, I think, to our basic understanding of social evolution. And that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks a lot for that. There's a lot to think about there. Um, as people put in questions, let's start, I think, with a question from Liz, and I have a couple too. Yeah, I have a bunch. I don't know which ones I want to start with. But I guess, given you started or ended with this more like theoretical perspective, do you think that like the theoretical models like that micro model you presented can ever get to the case where we're like incorporating this behavioral plasticity, which seems to really drive these groups? Or do you think that will make it so specific, maybe that they're not applicable? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. I think I think there is very, very simple there's a, there's a big uh, opportunity there, I think, to try and build in simple um, elements of negotiation into evolutionary models, which tend to be based on the evolution of sort of fixed blind genetic strategies. But I think there are simple ways of building in um, negotiation. Um, for example, one, one way is to just think about sequences of behavior like, um, where one individual moves first and, and their move can be observed and responded to by another. And as soon as you do that, actually, then you get some really kind of interesting effects. So relatedness, for example, has the opposite effect that you might expect. We've shown um, in phase paper uh, and in other models, too, you get a kind of counterintuitive effects of relatedness in sequential games. Um, that's because you can't kind of threaten your own offspring very, very easily, as I've discovered quite often with my own kids, um, credibly at least. Uh, but you, you, you can't credibly threaten relatives. Uh, and also, for example, in pay-to-stay models, you find that um, when you've got this threat of eviction, for example, then less related helpers have to help more than closely related ones to stay in the group. So there's already, I think, the first, uh, the first kind of uh, types of extension of existing theory is suggesting that the theory of negotiation is going to throw up lots of interesting um, and testable predictions. Um, so I think there is lots to do there and lots of hope for a better understanding of that process. Yeah, I think that'd be really great to, to learn more about. I have one other kind of curiosity question now that you uh, brought up the relatedness thing. So you talked about relatedness within a group. Do are between group relatedness, does that affect uh, aggression between groups? Like are females seeking out more unrelated groups to pick fights with? That's a really, really good question. We haven't tested for that. I, I think that they probably, they're, they're limited in who they can get their extra group matings from. So each group has only like two or at most three neighbors that are kind of candidates to get matings from. But that, that's a really interesting question. We haven't kind of looked in that detail um, but it's something that we could do, I think. Um, yeah. But that's a, really, that's a really good point, yeah. Cool, well, let me know when you do it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so I have two questions, one of which is mongoose related and one of which is more speculative. Um, so I was just, I'm just wanting to hear what you're going to do, like what you see as the future of the, the animal tracking with the drone technology and, and what kinds of questions that's going to let you answer. Yeah, so what, one, one question that we, before COVID that we, got interested in was whether there's different types of leadership in the face of conflict versus in more peaceful circumstances. So, um, you know, in human societies, there's some kind of tentative evidence that war, in times of war, that groups might uh, accept a more dictatorial power structure within, within the group than they do in times of peace. So that's one of the things that I thought would be interesting that we could try and test. I also... Um, yeah, I, I also wonder what we could actually, because we can track individuals and exactly what they're doing in these conflicts. I mean, I just wonder at what level we'll be able to dig down and find uh, and answer questions about how much risk individuals are willing to take for the group 
And also what's behind this kind of galvanizing effect of certain key individuals that Patrick's work is starting to uncover. You know, when you think about kind of charismatic leaders in battle and so on, you know, are they having their effect via they kind of steal everyone's will on the on their own side, or are they kind of intimidating the opposition or some kind of combination of both? I think fighting in a group like that is a very cognitive, it's a cognitive phenomenon, holding steadfast in the face of an enemy in a in this kind of uh, um, in a in a multi-individual system is a mystery. It's a very mysterious process, and I really I'm really interested in those elastic strings that hold the group together under pressure like that. And then maybe we'll close with this and it's maximum speculation, uh, which is, you know, you start by talking about these evolu major evolutionary transitions and how it seems like, you know, with an N of one on our planet, uh, increased kind of cooperation leads to ever increasing complexity over time. So the question is, what is the, what do you think the next major evolutionary transition is? Or have we have we reached our limit uh, on this planet as, as kind of uh, individual group size in the case of nation states kind of approaches population size? Yeah, well, um, so I kind of don't have a beard to stroke. <laughs> I'll answer this, but I, I, I no, I think I, I'm struck by Daniel McShay, a philosopher, makes this point that humans are often kind of put at the end of this process, but they don't really fit there because really what you're looking at is this kind of progression in vertical complexity. And um, the next step in vertical complexity would be a society of societies or cooperation between societies, as you might see in, for example, polydomus ants or something like that. Mm -hmm. Humans seem to be a side branch doing something different and they do, they achieve uh, these kind of collective feats, not through becoming uniform clonal uh, reducing all conflict, but by by these mechanisms of, of negotiating and uh, which, which allow them to achieve group agency, allow them to achieve these feats when they need to, while retaining genetic diversity, while retaining kind of diversity in ideas and perspectives and culture and so on. So, so that trick of managing to achieve unity with diversity, I think, is 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 the trick that humans have, have, have kind of nailed, um, and that's sending them off into a, a on a different a different sort of path. So I'm, I'm not I'm not wedded to the idea that the major transitions theory in the kind of evolution of genetic societies is very easily translatable into the kind of human realm, but it's still fascinating. <laughs> well, thanks. I think that's a, a good place to leave it. This has been a really great talk and inspired lots of kind of. Uh fundamental questions in my mind. So thanks so much for joining us. And uh, everyone else out there, uh, we'll be here next week. Uh, oh, we might have one more question. Um, well, we'll stick around for a moment if you have a, if you have a minute, Mike. But everyone else will be here uh, same time, same place next week. Um, we'll hope to see you there. Rita, did you have a question? Um, if so, you can either type it into the Q&A or I can try to promote you to a panelist if that is not possible. Let's see. Let's try this allow to talk button. Oh, it was a mishap. Okay, well then, great to see everybody. Thanks, Mike. This was really, really fascinating. Thanks so much. See you Thank all you. next week.